Okay, we are in this series called Thrive. If you will find that in your Bibles or on your device, Daniel chapter three, uh, we are looking, actually Daniel gets a week off uh, today because we are looking at his three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, while, you're to, while you're finding that passage, I wanna encourage you to stay engaged uh, in what we're learning through Daniel uh, by listening to, we uh, launched the Dive podcast uh, this past week, the Dive podcast, and you can, uh, uh, engage in that uh, by texting 219-336-2135. Uh, text that number and we will give you the information that you need to give us your feedback. Uh, you can pose a question if there's something that uh, uh, is... Uh, you know, confusing to you, or if you just have a comment or feedback on what you're learning. Uh, every Wednesday, uh, we are going deeper in the Word of God through uh, what we taught uh, this past weekend. And so we want this to be in- in- interactive and engaging for you. Uh, we want, of course, this to be beneficial to you uh, as we all go deeper uh, in the Word of God. So uh, we want to do this together through our study of Daniel and, uh, and beyond. So uh, let's get into this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego take center stage and the story of Daniel, they are thrown into, if you grew up in Sunday school, you're familiar with this story. Uh, They were thrown into the furnace of fire because they refused to bow to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up uh, in the land. And they make what I believe to be the most provocative and profound statement that you find uh, declarations in all of the Bible. And so I want to go straight to that and then we'll go back and unpack this story. But in verse 15, a Nebuchadnezzar says to these three guys, you, you're going to bow or you're going to burn. And if you, if you choose not to bow, he asks this question, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? I'm your king. I'm in power. I have all the authority. I have, I have power over your life. And if you don't do what I say, who's, who's going to deliver you from this? You have no hope or recourse or options. There is no escape or salvation for you. There is no God who can intervene on your behalf. Doesn't sound like thriving, right? And yet these three Hebrew men, and you have to remember, like Daniel, they're all contemporaries. At the age of 16 or 17 years old, they were ripped out of their homes. They were thrown into a godless culture, trained and assimilated into the Babylonian culture, and yet they maintained their identity of God, as God followers. And so their response to Nebuchadnezzar is this, "Oh Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Who will deliver us? Verse 17, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Verse 18, but if not, but if not, everyone say, but if not, but if not, say it again, but if not, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But if not, this is the key statement in chapter three. But if not, this story is about courage and resolve. It's about persecution and suffering. This story is about faith and perseverance. This, is about, this story is about loving God for God and serving him for no other reason that he is God, that he is the one true God. We've been asking the question and answering the question, how do you follow Jesus in a world that does not follow Jesus? Friends, this story is about thriving when your very life is at stake because of your faith in the one true God. Not just surviving, but actually thriving in the culture that is antithetical to your faith. We've been talking about this for the last several weeks, the cultural shifts making it more and more challenging to live out an authentic Faith. This has been happening for a long time. It seems that that it's shifting very rapidly and quickly. And as a result, you know, there's just a lot of head shaking going on, isn't there? There's a lot of hand wringing. There's a lot of, you know, what's going on and what is this world coming to? There's no shortage of doomsday end times prognosticators. The thing, the thing is, friends, we know what this world is coming to, right? We know what this world is coming to. It's coming to a fire. Uh, we've talked about the cultural attitudes and the public you know, policies that are making it more difficult uh, for the church, for, for, for Jesus followers to live out their faith. And so I think, we, I think we just need to stop for a second. We need to maybe develop a different, we need to, to, to have a different perspective on this cultural moment that's making it more and more difficult. But friends, is it making it more difficult or is it just simply giving us more opportunity? The darker our world, the brighter our light. It's bad, but I, you know, you think it's bad now. I, I think we just need to be reminded that in the first century, 
you know, followers of Jesus were literally, you know, fed to the lions for sport. They were dipped in oil and set on fire to illuminate the streets of Rome. So you think it's bad now. And you think it's bad here. You know, I, I mentioned about the, uh, last week about the church exploding in other parts of the world. And with that comes all kinds of resistance and persecutions. Organizations like Voice of the Martyrs and the Open Door International uh, reports that every month, every month, 300 believers are killed for their faith in places like Africa and India and China. Every month, 200 churches, over 200 churches and faith-based properties are destroyed uh, every month, over 700 acts of violence are perpetrated toward Jesus, uh, Jesus followers. Now, you don't see that happening in our particular culture. In America, we're just arguing over masks in a service or whether we have to meet in a parking lot, right? <laughs> in fact, on Thursday, um, uh, I was finalizing this message, and this wasn't a part of my research, but uh, uh, I was reminded of how often I fail uh, to pray for the persecuted church around the world. I found this verse in, in my daily readings, 1 Samuel 12, 23, that says, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord, that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. We are called to pray for one another, to support one another in prayer. And we, Samuel says, I, I sin against the Lord when I fail to do that. So I just, you know, that, was, I, that just convicted me this, this week, that, that I so often fail to pray for those uh, around the world who are living out their faith at the cost of their very lives. So I just want to take a moment this morning and pray for those around the world in that kind of a situation. You think it's bad now, you think it's bad here, but friends, there are people literally giving their lives, laying down their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ every day. So would you bow your heads right now? I just, I just want to pray, take a moment to pray. Uh, Father, uh, out of sight, out of mind, we so often are forgetful. We are wrapped up in our own inconveniences to pray for our brothers and sisters who literally put us to shame in standing before the world saying that we have no need to answer this question of the world. We have a God who will save. We have a God who will deliver. But if not, if not, we will not bow to the idols of our world. And friends, or God, may their sacrifice not go unnoticed by us and certainly not go unrewarded by you. Give us the courage to stand like our brothers and sisters, whatever the cost, for the one who stands in the gap for us. To that end, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at this story in Daniel chapter 3. Let's start with verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. There's a lot of verses in this chapter. If you have it open to you, you can scan the story as I tell it. Uh, but this goes on to tell us that Nebuchadnezzar set uh, up this idol and then he created this, he orchestrated this orchestra uh, to play music. If you've ever played musical chairs, you know, when the music is playing and then it stops, you find a chair. Well, at this particular situation, when the music starts, you bow a knee. Okay, so wherever you are and whatever you're doing in the moment, when you hear the music, you are to stop what you're doing and you are to bow the knee to this idol. Now, again, we've been learning in this series uh, how, how crafty uh, and how good the Babylonians were at controlling the entire world, the entire uh, empire by bringing exiles in from all over the kingdom, Daniel and his friends among them, training them and assimilating them in the culture of Babylon. This was a very pluralistic culture. This was a mix of nationalities and ethnicities and religions, and they're bringing them all together, trying to assimilate them into the one Babylonian culture. And what's notable about this particular idol that Nebuchadnezzar sets up, it's not given a name. It's not assigned to a particular deity. It is not talking about one particular God. It's representing all of the gods. And the message from Nebuchadnezzar is, I'm not commanding you uh, to worship my God instead of your God. Simply worship my God along with your God. Just add it to your worship. In other words, believe what you want, but do what I say. Privately, hold to your own faith, but publicly, uh, believe like everyone else. Fall in with the crowd. Go along. Now, friends, is this not relevant uh, to our own day? We live in a culture that's sending out this message more and more under the guise of tolerance. To be, you can believe whatever you want, just don't bring it into the public square. Keep it, keep it on Sundays, keep it in your house, 
keep anything Christian out of the systems of the world, this, you know, the, the educational system, the political system. I just want to use one example of this. There are, very, there are a lot of, of examples we could use, but recently in our history, whatever you think of Brett Kavanaugh, um, one of the arguments uh, against his appointment to the Supreme Court was that he was a professing Catholic. And being one who held to a biblical worldview, he thus disqualified himself, his opponent said, from making sound legal judgment on behalf of the rest of the country. You can't be a Christian and, and have sound legal judgment. Now, on the other hand, I've heard politicians say, maybe you've heard them say, defending cultural issues like abortion, saying they, they literally say, I don't allow my private faith to influence public policy. Now, friends, that's not only impossible, that's actually insane. Your worldview will always influence your decisions, either privately or publicly, on everything. Otherwise, it's not your worldview. Does that make sense? You can't believe in the sanctity of life privately and not fight for the sanctity of life publicly. Otherwise, it's not your worldview. And yet you see that kind of uh, confusion and conflict in our culture every day. Nebuchadnezzar uh, was setting up this kind of culture. He was the pro at cultural and social engineering. I don't care what you believe in your heart, just keep it to yourself. Blend in, go with the flow, adapt and assimilate. Because he knew that in time, when you, when you give in to the pressure of conforming, it will dilute your convictions. It's like the frog and the kettle strategy. Well, I will tur slowly turn up the heat until you don't realize what's happening to yourself and it's too late to jump out. So here's the consequence of not bowing. Verse six, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So you've got all of these nationalities, all of these ethnicities, Hebrews included, Daniel and his friends, and here's the temptation, to, you know, it's just an idol, right? And idols are nothing. I mean, the Bible tells us that idols are nothing. And so, you know, we, I know what I believe privately. I know what I, you know, adhere, I know what I'm convicted of and committed to. So, I mean, I can bow on the outside without bowing on the inside. I know what I believe in my heart, so I can, I can just play, play along. And yet these guys knew, they knew that every time you compromise on the outside, you are bowing on the inside. Every time you go along to get along, you bow. Every time you bow, friends, you're losing who you are. Now, here's, here's the deal. Everyone bows to something. You're always bowing to something. Every day is an exercise in bowing. What you give your time and money and energy to, the, the values you embrace, the principles you live out, the decisions that you make, the truth that you follow or don't follow. Friends, you are created to bow. You were wired to bow. What matters most to you is what you will bow to. And you'll hear people say, and, uh, I, you know, I don't bow to anybody. I don't bow to anything. Well, you're bowing to your own pride. You're, make, you're, you're bowing to your own deity. What you bow to identifies who you are. And so these men knew that they could not bow on the outside without bowing on the inside. Verse 12, their enemies go to the king and they tell Nebuchadnezzar, you know what? There's Jews in your kingdom who are refusing to bow. Do you know that? They're, they're paying no attention to you. And the king naturally, verse 13, gets angry at that, brings these three men in. Now, what you need to realize is that these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these are men that, that the king has already promoted. He knows these men. He knows the value of these men to his kingdom. And so if you read the story, he actually gives them a second chance to bow. He didn't have to do that. But this speaks to the distinctiveness uh, and, and the value that they had in the kingdom. We will see this with Daniel in chapter 6. Nebuchadnezzar did not want to do this. Their character and their competence put Nebuchadnezzar in a bind. He did not want to lose these men. And yet he was the king. He had to save face. He had to follow through with this. And so he says to them, if you don't do this, I will have no choice but to throw you in the fiery furnace. And then verse 15, who, who's going to deliver you from this? Who's going to deliver you out of my hands? To which they respond, we don't need to answer that question, Neb. We have a God who can. We have a God who will. Verse 18, but if not, but if not, 
This is the line we will not cross. Friends, this is so powerful. Listen, listen to what they're saying. We've decided, we've resolved, we know who we are, we know what we believe, we know what we're up against, we know the price that has to be paid, and we will not bow. Our God can, our God will, but if not, we will not. In fact, this is what they say. God may not save us, but he will deliver us. Now think about that. God may not save us, but he will deliver us. What, what, what do they mean by that? A couple of things. First, the reason they were able to say no to God, or excuse me, the reason they were able to say no to Nebuchadnezzar is because they had said yes to God the day before and the day before that and the day before that. In chapter one, it says that they resolved. They resolved. Long ago, they resolved. Here's the deal, friends. If you haven't resolved, you will not refuse. You can't wait for the moment of decision to decide how you're going to decide. You've got to dissolve beforehand. If you, if you don't resolve, you, you will find it very difficult to refuse. They knew Nebuchadnezzar wasn't bluffing. They had seen him execute people before for far lesser things. They, they knew that this day might come. And so they had resolved every day leading up to this day how they would decide. That's the first thing. Second thing, one thing that you need to realize, friends, that this is not a happy ever after Story. I mean, we know how this story ends, but the end of the story is not the point of the story. The point of the story is the but if not. The moral of the story is not love God and nothing bad will happen to you. The moral of the story is love God and take whatever comes. The moral of the story is serve God and pay whatever price. Because whatever comes will not keep God from delivering you. My God can, he may not, but he will deliver. Friends, does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to Jesus followers. Nobody really understands this except Jesus followers. Paul understood it. Remember in the, in the book of Philippians, uh, he, he said, you can kill me or you can let me live. Doesn't really matter, I win. <laughs> if you let me live, I'll just keep on serving. If you don't let me live, I'll be in heaven with Jesus. This world is not my home. So it doesn't really matter which way this, this goes for me. My, my God may not save me from this particular peril, but he will deliver me from your hand. I am more than a conqueror in Christ. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. While I'm here, I'll do my job. When it's over, I'll be in heaven. Nothing, friends, nothing, nothing on earth is a happily ever after. We know how this world ends. We know where this world is headed. And this is their resolve. And so they are, they, they are just, they're not phased. Which makes the king even angrier. Verse 19, he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, seriously, how hot do you need it to be? I mean, have you ever studied fire? I've never studied fire, but I do understand that there's colors to fire depending on how hot the fire is. You know, a red and orange and white and blue. We don't know the color of this fire, but we know that it was already hot enough to burn people alive. And so he's, he's, not, he's not making it seven times hotter to make sure that it works. I mean, what's a few more degrees when you're already getting fried? It was, it was already so hot that the men throwing them into the fire died just getting close to the fire. So what's the point, Nebuchadnezzar? The point is nobody's going to defy the king and get away with it. The point is nobody's going to say no to me and get a pass. You will bow or you will burn. And so they tied them up. They throwed them into the fire. The king comes uh, to witness the burning. And yet, instead of uh, watching the burning, he is astonished at what he sees. Verse 24, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Verse 25, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a sun of the gods, the son of the gods. This is, this is called a theophany or a Christophany. Jesus shows up several times in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. He is a pre-incarnate manifestation of the son of God, the second person of the Trinity in the Old Testament. And in this particular situation, he's walking around with these three men in the midst of the flames. Nebuchadnezzar sees this, he witnesses this. And because of this, he has a change of heart. He has somewhat of a come to Jesus moment. And so he pulls them back out of the fire 
And he makes this declaration in verse 28. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside my command and yielded up their own bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. He realizes what these men had just done and the price they were willing to pay. And so in verse 29, he says, therefore, I make a decree. He, he totally switches gears here. Any person, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb in their house. Now, okay, so he, he's, he's been justified but not sanctified. I mean, he's, he's still, you know, still kind of on this destruction mode. But he says, if, if you say anything against one true God... I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be torn limb from limb. Your houses are going to be laid in ruins for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Verse 30, then the king promoted once again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. But if not, everyone say, but if not, but if not. Friends, the call of the gospel is to come and die. The invitation of Jesus is to lay down your own life to receive the life of Jesus in you, to yield up your own body. In the Bible, furnaces are a metaphor for trials and troubles. Fire is, is, is the illustration for the faith and the character that is refined. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Friends, do you want to know your own heart? Do you want to know if you have a profound faith in God to the point of laying down your life to be able to put, do you know that you can put the full weight of your life on his sovereignty regardless of the outcome of your life? Do you want to know that you love God for God and not for what God can do for you? Do you know, you want to know if you can serve God regardless? You know that he can deliver. You know that he will deliver. But if not, you're still unwilling to bow to the idols of this world. The bottom line is, friends, that you were made for, to bow. You were created to bow. The question is, to whom will you bow? These three men have already answered that question. Hopefully, you've already answered that first question. How do you thrive in the, the fire? First of all, you've got to decide to whom you will bow. But let me offer two more suggestions as we close out. Here's the second one. Uh, what are you bowing for? What are you bowing for? These men had no guarantees. There was no promise from God that they would be delivered from this fire. And I need to press that point because I've seen this too many times in the lives of would-be Jesus followers. God didn't come through for me, so I'm out. I prayed, but he didn't answer my prayer. I've lived a good life. I've, done, I've gone to church. I do all the right things. Why isn't God doing what I want? Friends, the foolishness of that kind of thinking, that God would owe you anything. The Bible tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. What, how does that engender God to, to owe us or to be indebted to us, to somehow feel entitled to preferential treatment? What are you bowing for? Are you bowing for what God can do for you or what you can get from God? You have to examine your own heart on this. Are you bowing for the outcome of your life to go your way? Or are you bowing for the glory of God no matter what? Are you willing to love God for God? In the words of Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? In the words of Paul, whether I live or die. Friends, if you're bowing to God to save you from fire, you will not survive the fire. But when you love God for God and nothing else, when you're serving God simply because he deserves to be served, when you realize that God owes you nothing and you owe him everything, you know what? You can face any fire. When you realize that God owes you nothing and you know, owe him everything, then you can walk through any fire. What are you bowing for? And here's the last question. Who are you bowing with? 
Because friends, it is very hard to bow for long when you're bowing alone. You were not, ma- you were not made for that. No one can bow for you, but we can all bow better when we bow together. If there was ever a need for, com- for the community of believers to come together and to stick together, it's in the culture that we're living in, right? What? Who are you bowing with? Who's encouraging you? Who's holding you accountable? Who's challenging your attitudes and decisions and behaviors? Who's helping you see those areas where you're bowing to the wrong God? Because if you're bowing alone, you're unlikely to bow for long. How do you follow Jesus in a world that does not follow Jesus? How do you thrive in the midst of the fires of your life? Well, I want to tell you, Jesus follower, I want to remind you, Jesus follower, that Jesus was thrown in the ultimate furnace for you. He took the fire of God's wrath so that you could be fireproof in the fires of your life. But there's more to it uh, than that. Every, every other religion in the world says, live a good life and God will save you. Serve the God, serve your God and nothing bad will happen to you. Friends, this is not the gospel. Jesus suffered for you. And he suffered for you so that you would not suffer. Not so that you would, you would not suffer. He suffered for you so that when you suffered, you, would, you could suffer like him. So that your faith and your character would come forth like gold in the fires of your suffering. Jesus walked through the fire for you. So you can walk through any fire for him. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower at this moment, you need to be reminded that everyone faces a fire. We all face the fire. What is this world coming to? What is your life coming to? It's, it's coming to a fire. And you have to, you have to answer the question, what, what God can deliver you from this fire? Jesus took the fire of God's wrath. Only the God who went through the fire for you is the God who is able to deliver you from this fire. If you need help on this, on understanding this, if you want to take your next step toward God and you have questions about this, um, I want you to text that number 219-336-2135. This is the way that we can respond to you. This is the way that we can answer your questions. This is the way that we can pray for you and help you to understand what your next step toward God might be. You just need to know that everyone faces a fire and the only God who can deliver us is the one who stepped in the fire with us and for us. Would you pray with me? We are so grateful, Jesus, that you did that for us. And help us, Father, in this story, help us to to realize that you did not exempt us from the fire, but that you will deliver us. So may, may we lay down our lives, may we surrender our bodies to the only God who can rescue us and deliver us. So that end we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.